Good day, everyone. Thank you, Rach, Gary, Charles, and Lane, and all of you present at this symposium for sharing your time and experience with us. Let me first introduce our panelists. Rusty Sodia is the FW All in Distinguished Professor of Global Business at Babson College. He's also co founder and co chairman of Conscious Capitalism Inc., an organization that supports a global network of business leaders devoted to elevating humanity through innovative business practices. Charles Walkie is the founder and CEO of Blueprint for Better Business, a UK charity that challenges the foundational assumptions of business and what motivates people in an effort to redefine the purpose of business and his relationship with society. Gary George is professor of management at McDonald School of Business. Previously, he served as dean at Lee Kong Kian School of Business at Singapore Management University. Jay Cohen Gilbert, who have the pre-recorded video, is a co-founder of B Lab, B Corporations, and a profit organization that promotes B Corps and serves a global movement of entrepreneurs using the power of business to solve social and environmental problems. I am Hector Rocha, and together with Roy, and Michael, and Elaine have put together this symposium on purpose. Purpose of society, purpose of business, and purpose of business schools in the post-pandemic world. But the first question to ask is, what is our purpose in organizing this symposium? So let us share with you why in three short episodes. Episode one, first, looking backwards, the question is, is this symposium new to society, business, and academia? And the answer is no. Why? Because we are followers of what other leaders began years, years ago. Just focusing on our century, we highlight three major events. In 2006, the first joint Academy of Management United Nations Conference on Business as Agent for World Benefit. Maybe many of you were there, but I remember she was the former Academy of Management Conference president and other colleagues teamed up to create this reflective space. I remember that one of the parallel workshops discussed the origin of what nowadays we know as the principles for responsible management education, a global movement transforming business and management education through research and leadership. As you see in this panel, we have academics together with leaders. In 2015, the UN launched the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And this year, the World Economic Forum launched the Great Reset Initiative to collectively manage the direct consequences of the COVID-19 crisis. Thus, the first reason for this symposium is to continue what other leaders began years ago. In the second episode, this in at press, the question is the same. Is this symposium new to society, business, and academia? But now, the answer is yes. Why? because we are followers of our personal call or vocation. And this is now, at this moment. We are healing to this, here to listen, Rach, Charles, Che, and Gary, answer to why they do what they do and how they respond to the three questions on society, business, and business education. But also we are here to listen to our own voice, call or, or vocation. That's the second reason for this symposium is to listen to their answers and to our own call or vocation. What I'm called to do through my academic vocation to contribute to a better society in the post-pandemic scenario. And the third episode is looking forward the next 85 minutes. The third reason of this symposium is built on the previous two one, is to create a reflective and motivational space of interconnected calls or vocations on the purpose of business and business education in post-pandemic scenario. This is why we start our symposium after we together with Roy, Michael, and Elaine, explain why we started this symposium. Now we are asking each panelist, why you do what you do? Rax, we'd like to, to start first. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for organizing this. Um, you know, I got involved with uh, conscious capitalism. We started the movement in 2008, and I had been a business professor for 22 years at that time. Uh, during uh, up to that time. And I was really frustrated with the story of business. And I just felt that it did not inspire anybody, that there was a low level of trust, and that there were many problems in society that we were contributing to, we weren't solving as, as many. So uh, my entry in it came through a book called Firms of Endearment, where I found that companies that are loved by customers, employees, suppliers, et cetera, 
actually have some unique characteristics that they have a higher purpose. There's a reason for their being that they are consciously stakeholder oriented and they have leaders who care about the people and the purpose uh, more than they care about power and uh, money and ego. And the cultures are ones where people actually look forward to going to work and there's a lot of trust and genuine caring. Where typical companies, you know, we have heart attacks 20% higher on Mondays and employee engagement has been in the 20s uh, or 30s at most in the US, even lesser around the world. So, you know, we found a different way of being. And, and we also discovered after the fact, after picking those companies that they outperformed the market dramatically, nine to one. So it wasn't a trade-off or a choice to say you can either be a successful business, which is very profitable, or you can be good for all your stakeholders and have a purpose that actually these two things can go together very well. So that's why we started this. And this was kind of the beginning of me living my own purpose because this now inspires me. I feel excited about what I was doing. Before I was a marketing professor who was kind of apologizing for what I was doing. But I feel now business can be indeed, business can be noble, business can be ethical, business can be heroic, and it can move humanity and uplift humanity uh, forward. So I feel really passionate about this. And, and fast forward now, since when we started, I think the need for all of this is even more pronounced with all the things that we have faced recently. You know, climate change has become even bigger of an issue, social inequality, the rise of populist movements, uh, anxiety, depression, suicide, all these things are increasing quite dramatically. So there's a lot of suffering out there <clears throat> in the world. And capitalism and business has been contributing to that suffering rather than alleviating it in many ways. Other than the material side, you know, on the other dimensions we've been hurting. So I think there's a tremendous need for this. Thank you, Rex Charles. <clears throat> thank you, Hector, and thank you very much for having me on the panel today as well. Well, uh, what Raj has said resonates very much with me. Uh, so I run a charity which, as Hector explains, called a Blueprint for Better Business, started in London after the financial crisis, really uh, with a number of business leaders and others getting together, really concerned about the breakdown of trust at that point and the deep disconnect between business and society. Uh, and the group that got together drew on thinking from philosophy, from faith, from psychology, as well as from economics and business. And our strong collective feeling was that there were, and there was a need to sh dominant ideas shape how business should show up and the market never exists in a pure state. And these very powerful ideas of Milton Friedman's around the maximization of profit and of agency theory around human beings being conceived as self-interested utility maximizers, a hugely powerful in shaping uh, the underlying thinking around business. And our, and our thought was that it was possible to construct a simple way of explaining how different ideas could shape business practice. And that was the hypothesis. And a bunch of us got together to try and put that into practice. And what struck me over the last six years is we've moved from a situation where I'm asked, okay, Charles, tell me the business case for purpose, to I get this, this is super important. How do you do this well? And how do you know in a HSS? So the, 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 the challenge for business leaders has dramatically changed. And I think the argument uh, has, has been made that people see that a different way of thinking about business aligns business success with societal benefit and what is also better for people. And the external challenges that Raz already referred to in terms of climate change and so on makes this super important. So I, I love what I do. I, I think we've stumbled on a way which is practical for business. And I've seen this happen in practice um, and it's not straightforward. Uh, but it's a very, very exciting challenge. So that's what inspires me, and it's a privilege to be involved in it. Thank you, Charles. Gary, your turn. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, compared to both Charles and Raj, um, I had a slightly different take. One was that I thought businesses were all trying to do a good job and to go, do good in the ways they did. And my inspiration came from actually from the research side. It's we as academics have pursued uh, sort of a financial model of businesses existing for its shareholders and that we did not do a good enough job of showcasing research and evidence that sort of says that businesses do better by doing good. And I think that was uh, my starting point. Um, I started off as uh, when I was editor of uh, AMJ and before that uh, uh, associate editor, my first article with um, 
Jason Colquitt in, as an editorial uh, was in 2010. And, and we, we started with the uh, concept of uh, what, what, why do businesses exist and what is impact in terms of uh, uh, businesses themselves and the research that we have. And then when I became editor, I was associate editor first with Jason's team. And then when I became editor, I, I was um, I was pushing this theme of grand challenges where, where research, uh, management research could truly be beneficial for the world. And part of that was uh, I had asked each of my associate editors, I uh, teamed with each of my associate editors and somebody in practice to sort of bring through um, salient topics. And one of that was purpose. And uh, Elaine kindly raised her hand to sort of lead the charge on that, that editorial and Charles was part of it. And when we interviewed uh, 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 Vincent Cardinal Nichols uh, and with, with the idea of what does managing with purpose look like? And we started off with a values-based system. Maybe I can talk about it later, but the whole idea for me, my inspiration came from research that uh, organizational scholars should step up to provide uh, evidence and support that sort of guides businesses do a better job of what they already do. Thank you, Rash, Charles, and Gary, for being so open to say why you do what, what you do. So with this uh, introduction, we have the, the reason why the symposium, now your reason for what you do. And now we are going to each of these questions. So. The idea is, is the following. So for, for all of you who are present here, you can use the chat at any moment to write your questions. So the idea is to have each question answered by the panelists, then we will put the video of Che answer to each question, and then we will moderate questions and answers and the dynamics. And then Elaine, at the end of the symposium, will do the closing remarks. So for the first question, Roy, I will, give you the, the floor to, to you about the foundational values. Great, uh, thanks very much, Hector. And uh, I'm, I'm terrible at time, so you're gonna have to uh, monitor my, my, my use of time here. Um, let, let me contextualize my, my question with a, a little personal anecdote. So um, when I did my uh, MBA uh, uh, back in the 1980s, the, the cultural uh, movie of the day was Wall Street. Uh, the cultural icon was Gordon Gecko, who said greed is good. Um, every one of my classmates, I think, got an MBA because they wanted to be rich. Um, after teaching for some decades in business schools, I'm, 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 I get the distinct sense that things have changed. I, I, I think that many students see uh, business education not as a means to wealth, but as a means to uh, use organizations to construct meaningful change in society. Uh, but I, I don't know if that's, if that's just my perception or if, if there's some, some uh, value shift, the fundamental value shift that's taken place in, in, in society. So, so my, my question to, to each of you is what might the foundational values of a post-pandemic market system be? And, and I'd, I'd like you to think of that question in, in two components. Is, are the fundamental values of this relationship between business and society actually changing? And, and if so, what, what role does the pandemic have in, in uh, accelerating or facilitating that, that process? And, and perhaps I'll keep the same order. I'll, I'll start with uh, Raj. Well, uh, I think, you know, we have to see this as an opportunity, really. And as they say, a crisis and opportunity are, are two sides of the same coin. And so as Tom Stoppard wrote, a door like this has cracked open only three or four times since we got up on our, on our two legs. And, uh, and so we have to see this as, as an opportunity to really rethink everything. I think we need to rethink uh, from a business standpoint, you know, why do we exist? What do we do? How do we do it? Who are we as leaders? What does it mean to be a leader? And what is our time horizon for decision making? And what is our definition of success? And I think all of those have to be deepened and enriched uh, beyond what they had. You know, we have some pretty low consciousness answers to those things. We exist to make money, and we do that by you know selling products and services to our customers and so forth. Uh, and the definition of leaders is we get the job done, we deliver the numbers, we deliver the stock price, and so forth. And the time horizons were pretty short. I think all of that. Uh, has to change. And, uh, and going forward, 
you know, we have to either we reform or I think we, we are in real danger, I do believe, that if we don't elevate capitalism and you don't start talking about it and practicing it differently, that this is a system that has done so much for humanity, but it could very well uh, be destroyed. That if we don't, we need to celebrate and elevate capitalism, otherwise we will decimate it. So I think that's really even more now urgent uh, coming out of uh, out of the pandemic and all of the things that this has revealed in terms of our vulnerability, our interconnectedness, uh, and and the need for all of us to uh, to be in this together. And I think fundamentally, the shift that has to happen is really kind of a Copernican shift almost. <clears throat> if you remember before Copernicus, we thought the Earth was the center and everything revolved around that. And he said, no, actually, we revolve around the sun and so forth. In business for a very long time, at least conceptually, as Jerry talked about, maybe a lot of businesses don't think that way, but conceptually, we put profit at the center and everything revolves around that, including people and the planet. Everything has to serve that. If it doesn't serve profit, it doesn't get done. And I think we have to flip that and put people and planetary flourishing at the center. And those two, uh, those two have to go together always. Uh, and then uh, the nature of work has to be purposeful. I think one of the interesting things I'm seeing out of this uh, uh, transition that we're in, a lot of people are not going back to their old jobs. They are elevating their sites. They are saying life is too short. I don't want to do the same meaning, meaningless job, you know, at subsistence wages that I was satisfied or at least uh, accepting earlier. So our work has to be meaningful and purposeful. Uh, you know, we have to be regenerative, not only uh, sustainable, but actually restore and replenish what has been harmed, you know, in terms of, uh, of nature. We have to eradicate exploitation of any kind uh, that uh, that we have a lot of in our system. I mean, I, coming from a marketing background, you know, a lot of it is about figuring out how to get customers to do something that's good in our uh, perspective, but not necessarily beneficial for them. <clears throat> so we have to uh, change all of these things. And the vision, I like the way David Cooper Ryder has recently stated it. I'm going to borrow that from uh, this book that he's editing. Uh, the vision is a world where businesses can excel, all persons can thrive, and nature can flourish forever. And I think that's the key thing. You know, the time, the future, in a way, is a stakeholder. We cannot act like, you know, these these time horizons that we look at are just incredibly narrow. So we need full alignment between people, society, the planet, uh, and profits. All of those things. What's good for one needs to be good for all. You know, uh, simultaneously. And, and that, that's going to take some rethinking. You know, there's a phrase that's used in some uh, South American indigenous cultures. <clears throat> the world is as you dream it. Everything that exists in the physical plane other than that which is in nature is something that existed inside a human mind before it got manifested in, in the physical plane. And if we don't like the world we're in, then we need to dream a new dream. We need to dream a better dream, a more beautiful dream to create this. So again, these are all institutions and ideas that we have created as humans, and we need to rethink them so that they truly serve us now and for forever. That's, uh, that's terrific, Raj. Thank you very much. Uh, Charles? Thank you. Yeah, I love that as well. Um, I think one of the things that strikes me about uh, the shift in values is very hard to, to, I find it very hard to make any kind of blanket judgment about this. But there's no doubt, certainly in our work in the UK context, that there was a lot changing after the great financial crisis. Um, and things were moving in some degree in shaking these dominant assumptions about profit being at the center, as Raj just described it. And I think the pandemic has dramatically accelerated that. And I would say three things that I've noticed that, that particularly are, uh, are striking. One is actually the expectation of the role of government and the idea that we need leveling up, not the trickle down. So in, certainly in, the, in the, the, the political discourse is an acceptance, including by business, of the need for the role of government in helping to reshape the recovery, which is a dramatic shift from, from the neoliberal uh, consensus before. Secondly, a recognition of interdependence, uh, a much stronger sense that these are serious collective action problems, climate change, inequality. As we know from the IMF and others, we've gone back 10 years in inequality as a result of the pandemic. And that's true both within countries and between them. And so these issues are much, much more urgent. And I think there's a greater sense of interdependence. And the third, particularly around business, uh, IB was very struck by the pro-social response of many companies in the UK and elsewhere, and the large multinationals we work with, to uh, their people, to their suppliers, to their customers, to the societies that they work in, where they really did say, how can we help? 
And there, this instinctive response was completely different from what happened after the financial crisis, where basically it was a return to austerity and a return to profit as quickly as possible. So that does, I'm very struck by that shift. Now, and Mark Carney, in a very good article, I thought, put it that the values of economic dynamism and efficiency have been joined by those of solidarity, fairness, responsibility and compassion. He wrote that in The Economist a few months ago and in his book recently. And I, I think that's evidence of this. Uh, and what I think now, of course, is that it's all up for grabs, right? So there's been an awful lot of good behavior in the, in, 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 in the pandemic and people have exercised new muscles and responded differently. And I think what's really interesting and difficult to predict is the extent to which this outlasts the post-pandemic recovery. And do we, as it were, see a return or do we see some of these reflexes, including changes in working patterns and practices, which often have been very liberating for people, very innovative, um, and, but also produced a lot of high stress. Uh, whether we can find new ways of working, which are putting people at the center of organizations and putting human flourishing and societal flourishing and the common good at the heart of things, rather than saying this simply is all about shareholder value. Um, I mean, I think there are difficult trade-offs. I don't believe in a frictionless win-win that you get to purpose-led business and profit and it's all beautiful. I think they're very difficult choices that have to be made. But it seems to me what excites me is that I think there are a number of people who are up for those choices in a world where the boundary conditions are very clearly evident. That's, that's terrific. And I, I, I love the three points and completely uh, agree with the three major observations you make. Just, just a quick follow up, because you, you had mentioned the effect of the, uh, I guess, the 2008 financial crisis. Now we have the, the pandemic. Do you see these as a series of escalating events that are building momentum that will sustain the changes you've described? Or um, are, they, are they independent events that have to recreate value change each time they happen? Well, I think they're independent. I mean, those two, I think, are independent events. Clearly, I mean, there's no reason to link the financial crisis and the pandemic. But I do think that the what the pandemic has done, in a way, maybe that the financial crisis has not done, is create a deeper sense of humanity's collective action problems. So there's no way of getting out of the pandemic until we all get out of the pandemic. And with the horrendous uh, weather system disruptions that we've seen across the world in the last 12 months alongside the pandemic. I think the penny is dropping that climate change is real uh, and uh, collective action there becomes an imperative on all, on all of us. So I do think that has moved strongly up. Where I think there's loads more to do is on the equivalent social inequality side. I think there's loads of work now being done on carbon and investors are piling in and it's easy to measure. But I think some of the other dimensions of what makes a better society through better business, which is a lot to do with the way in which people are treated and how businesses put people at the heart of their success. I think that's much, much more difficult to call. Terrific. Th thanks very much, Charles. Uh, Jerry. Uh, so Roy, I'll pick up from where Charles left off. And I think that really is a very salient point. From how I see it, the pandemic has changed three big assumptions. And these are uh, sort of assumptions that I don't think we can go back on. The first one is uh, the what I call the organizational assumption, how we work and, and, and what is the nature of the organization and the purpose of an organization. Uh, I think that the, the pandemic has brought that to, uh, to sort of change some fundamental assumptions around that. The second one is it's changed an assumption around what we do. Right, and, I, I, and, and, and uh, uh, Raj had mentioned about meaning in work. Uh, uh, you, you know, I, I was the dean at, uh, at Singapore and it made a lot of sense. Uh, the pandemic changed uh, our assumptions. We had two daughters living in London for us not being able to travel. And then for a reflection of what is it that I'm doing that really creates value and is that personal value and that consonance of what am I doing that gives meaning, not just for the work that I do, the people around me and the impact I have. So I think it's changed some assumptions on what we do, right? Uh, uh, because uh, we, we've always thought this world is where we can travel freely, we can connect freely. And if some of those assumptions uh, fray, then, then we have to rethink uh, some of that, right? And I think uh, there is a huge question around what we do and, and uh, has that changed? The third assumption that is fundamental is how we feel about things, right? Um, if, if you 
if anything that came out of this pandemic, this deep sense of empathy and caring, um, I, I think that made a huge difference for not just individuals, for organizations, for us to, uh, because individuals around organizations, uh, they're not uh, sort of separated from it, right? So, so this empathy and caring and, and, and that has made us reflect a lot more about purpose. Uh, I have to apologize that it looks like I'm crying, but I've got an eye infection, so I can't actually see the screen too long because it starts watering. But uh, uh, so it, I think the three assumptions of uh, how we organize, what we do, and how we how we feel uh, are are uh, are changed, right? And and that makes us reflect a lot more about purpose. Let me tie it back to a bit about what we've done earlier the article, uh, the 2014 AMJ article, uh, editorial with Elaine and, and Charles. Uh, there we talk about purpose and the common good, but we talk about six values, right? Uh, and the six values are uh, dignity, uh, plurality, solidarity, uh, subsidiarity, uh, reciprocity, and sustainability, right? And if we think about what these values are, it's not that these values didn't exist before, it's now it puts a lot of light on how we think about dignity, how we think about plurality, the whole Black Lives Matter, the whole idea of diversity and plurality that everybody matters in a way. Uh, solidarity is about us feeling connected with other, other missions and us doing it together. Uh, the pandemic has put a big, big spotlight on solidarity that we curtail our own behaviors for a collective good. Uh, uh, this idea of reciprocity, if I do something, uh, there is some give back in society. And, and I think that that has come out as well. And subsidiarity, where I say, I curtail my wishes because I'm of a greater good. Uh, even there, we can see a lot of these examples. And of course, sustainability. Uh, we talk about climate change and all of these uh, issues, but it's not that they didn't exist before. It's just that now organizations, when they rethink how we are organized, what we do and how we feel, it puts emphasis on all, all of these at a much more uh, sort of not just stronger, but in a deeper sense of conviction that what we are doing doesn't really uh, cut it and that we have to rethink some of the fundamental assumptions of organizations and the interaction with society. I'd like to end this sort of with a, a sentence from that article uh, where Cardinal Vincent was talking about, business is a part of society, not apart from society, right? And, and if we think about that, it's just a play on the word apart uh, or being a part, but it, it is sort of this idea that uh, if we are in this together, then we have to rethink uh, how we do things. And that goes to Raj and Charles's earlier points. That's, a, that's as an institutional theorist, I, lo I love the fact that you focus on how these events have challenged or taken for granted uh, uh, assumptions. Much of, uh, much of our organized world we, we take for granted and it takes events yes. like this to, uh, to challenge that. I'm very, very conscious of the time, Hector. So I'm going to turn things over to you uh, for the right. second round. Okay, first, uh, can we play the, the video just to see a uh, choice answer to this question? Just uh, two minutes. Let me share. Post pandemic world. Okay, our first question is what might be the foundational values of a post pandemic market system? Uh, well, Hector and Michael, thank you so much for inviting me to join the symposium. It's a real honor to be with you today. In terms of the core values uh, of a post-pandemic system, I think that the core value is one that recognizes our inherent connection and not our separation. And so the core value is one uh, of interdependence and uh, that puts people and community at the center of our economic decision-making and uses profit as the fuel to fuel our economic activity, but not as the, the goal or the variable for which we're solving when we're, when we're uh, making economic decisions. And uh, this will show up 
in values, universal values, like the golden rule. Like we want to be, we want to treat others as, as if, as we would want to be treated. Um, and that means the people that we partner with, the people that we employ, uh, our suppliers, the community that we operate in, and the environment. So it's healthy for our children and our children's children. Um, values of, of equity and inclusivity and regeneration would all be central to an economic system that is centered on people and community and that recognizes our fundamental interdependence. So th those are the values that I see underpinning uh, any post uh, pandemic economic system. And if you're looking for a, for a silver lining in the immense suffering that's taken place over the last 18 months, and that continues as we look at the Delta variant and how that might continue uh, to create economic challenges for, for all of us and some more than others. Um, uh, the inherent inequity of an economic system whose central value is maximizing profit is much more evident now uh, mm. than it was two years ago. Um, but with the pandemic, with uh, uh, the climate emergency, with the inequality and uh, racial reckoning that's going on all around the world, we really um, have a much better understanding and we can much better feel today than we could before uh, the true nature of our interdependence. Um, so that that's to me is the core the core value uh, of a, of a new economic system is one that's centered on independence. Okay, well, we have all the answers. Thank you very much for 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 your answers. Um, let me go to the the second question to moderate this one. Um, we are talking about a choices alignment and how to do simultaneously profit and environment and and society and. Um, the question is, what might be the purpose of business in a post-pandemic scenario? Is there an intrinsic purpose out there to be discovered or we need to create a new purpose? You would like to continue with the same sequence, Raj? Well, you know, I think about this in a couple of ways. You know, one is there's tremendous suffering in the world. I think we need to recognize that. There's economic suffering. There's, of course, uh, suffering because of the pandemic uh, and many, many other factors. And if you look at all of that suffering, the, the response to that suffering has to be some kind of healing. And my last book was called The Healing Organization. I just want to share why I chose that and why I believe that's an, a way to think about business that with so much suffering in the world, all of us, regardless of whatever job we do, we can think about our role as how do we heal that, which means how do we reduce the suffering that we're able to impact and how do we bring more joy and how do we promote healthy growth in the world? And I think that's a way to think about every business because think about the role of business in a free society. Businesses are given the uh, opportunity for meeting our needs. You know, governments don't meet most of our needs. Governments just provide the uh, infrastructure and the rule of law. Businesses have the opportunity to sense and respond to all of our needs. Now, the way in which we do that really makes a difference, right? So if you start with the presumption that we are here uh, in this life on this earth, to care for each other and to grow, right? To evolve ourselves into who we are uh, supposed to be, meant to be, and to care for each other. I believe that business is a way we can do those two things as, at scale. In my normal life, I can only care for a handful of people, but if I practice business with the right mindset, that we can actually care for you know, limitless uh, numbers of people. So I think that's a way that we need to think about business. It's a way to serve people, care for people, and through that achieve our goals, as, as opposed to saying, I'm gonna focus on my goals, which is to make as much money as possible and use people, whether they're employees or customers in order to achieve that. I think that mindset shift makes all the difference as to whether a business becomes a place of suffering or a place of healing and joy. And I've seen that countless, You know, I wrote a book called Everybody Matters where that was kind of my inspiration for the idea of business as healing where this uh, CEO came in and completely transformed businesses that were struggling and dying, 120 of them so far he's acquired. Um, this is Bob Chapman or Barry Wimler, and turned them all around by employing these kinds of ideas, putting people at the center and genuinely caring for them. So I think we need to rethink the whole notion of what business in that sense is about. We need to break this uh, trade-off mentality that we have where we think, uh, you know, Things are alternatives, you know, the polarities that need to be integrated. 
uh, whether it's profit and purpose, whether it's people and the planet, uh, strength and love, uh, dynamism and decency, you know, this whole debate about capitalism and socialism and so forth. There's a reason why those two poles exist because people see some value in them, but we end up getting identified with one of those. The fact is we need dynamism and we need decency. You know, we need dynamism and we crave decency and, and no one system is gonna give us both unless we evolve that to a higher level of thinking. So I think that's where we need to go. And, and, and in doing all of this, we need to remember that profit is still important. Profit matters, profit is a social good. You know, I think it's socially irresponsible not to be profitable because free societies don't function without, without profits, right? Governments don't create wealth. They can only tax and spend the wealth that businesses generate. So we have to, and, and all the research that we've done and others have done shows that business done in this way generates superior profits, in many cases dramatically so in the long run, right? But it matters greatly how you make the money. And I think that's where we've had this blind spot. We have pursued profit uh, and we, uh, and in pursuit of that, we've been willing to um, uh, create conditions where people are harmed, their health is harmed, uh, you know, their the society, communities, the environment, all of that, right? We paid a high price. And we need to recognize that businesses create, but they also destroy not just financial wealth, but also at least seven, seven other kinds of wealth. Uh, I see the emotional well-being of people, the spiritual well-being, the ecological well-being, the impact on the culture, um, you know, the impact, intellectual contributions. I mean, there's many different dimensions along which we create or destroy value in business. And I think what we need to think about is how do we simultaneously create all of those different kinds of wealth for all of our stakeholders as long as we exist without the idea of trade-offs, right? And without thinking of some things as side effects. I mean, the fact is there's no such thing called a side effect. We do things and there are effects. Just because you call it a side effect doesn't make it less important. I would argue the side effects of business have become untenable for us now, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's in the climate or whether it's in, uh, in, in, in the impact on people's well-being. So we need to do business with a spectrum of positive effects. You know, in a sense, we can phrase it as we need positive externalities. We need to reject the idea of negative externalities uh, completely. So I think, again, stepping back, rethinking the purpose of business fundamentally as an instrument of caring for each other and, and, and scaling that through the business and, and, and determining how we can elevate, so, uh, elevate joy, reduce suffering, promote healthy growth. And the last thought I have, you know, Richard Lider, who's one of the, the great thinkers about purpose, talks about a generic purpose for all of us if we haven't figured out our unique purpose. Our generic purpose as human beings is to give and to grow, right? To evolve ourselves so that we are then capable of giving so much more, right? To give and grow. And I think that's true of every business as well. And unfortunately, the paradigm that we've been in so far is that most people are about grab and go. How much can I grab and then get out of here, right? In my tenure as CEO, et cetera. So we need to move from grab and go to give and grow. And I think that's the only way forward. And unless business makes that shift, you know, the rest of society, really, we cannot do it without business. And business is the lead actor in many ways uh, for the future of our uh, survival and, and thriving on this planet. Thank you, Rash, for um, many things on here, but a way to serve, you say, serving, caring, leading to healing and joy. It reminds me, Shun Peter say that the motivation of the entrepreneur is the joy of creation. So I think that we are tapping on an important thing because it's our vocation. Mm -hmm. So it's not, we are not the, the bad guys of the, the movie. And profit as social goods is another key, key point and capability to scale because the government cannot do that. So we have a place and a work to do. Michael, what would be the, the purpose of, of business in a post-pandemic scenario? I'd like to answer that question. Michael. Do you mean me, Charles? Charles, Charles, sorry. <laughs> I was, I was so sure. looking at Michael. And yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> I was wondering when Michael was going to appear. That's fine. Uh, so, <laughs> I, I mean, I have a lot. Uh, so just going back to the end of the last discussion, a phrase I sometimes find myself using, uh, which I've taken from one of the COP documents, is that we need to move from a world where the economic system is optimized for growth and profit to a world where the economic system is optimized for human well-being and a sustainable ecosystem. 
And if that's the big shift at the system level, then purpose led business is the way in which business contributes to that system shift as opposed to impedes that system shift. And it doesn't mean that growth and profit don't matter, but what it does mean is that we don't want growth for its own sake or profit for its own sake. What we want is growth in profitable solutions to the problems of people and planet, which is Colin Mayer's phrase, which I like, without adding to the problems of people and planet. And I think that conception of business as, as Raj is eloquently saying, helping humanity to solve problems and to produce shared prosperity is great. My worry about the purpose movement as it's developed over the last few years, and we've been part of helping that happen, and it's wonderful, is that you can have a brilliant purpose and a good strategy that follows from it and still be a terrible place to work and not care about people. And I think in the rhetoric around purpose, we need to keep the human side of this really in play, because essentially, I think what we're all agreeing is that businesses are social organizations. They're a form of human community building. And I think that aspect, and in fact, it is the most fundamental aspect, if one starts from the idea of the dignity of the person and the common good, the businesses are basically places of human flourishing through the activities that they do. And a good purpose orientates a shared endeavor around something that's useful in the world. That's brilliant, but it's only going to really work if the quality of relationships internally and externally is one that enables people to flourish and is one that respects people. So we use the language of being purpose led which is not very good, but it's the kind of best way I can try and get hold of how you characterize what's going on when you care both about why are we all here and what's the better world that arises from our being profitable and successful and that we care about people and the quality of relationships. And I, we have to do both of these things because both of these things lie at the core of the, idealize, uh, of the ideology which has been so dominating in business life which fundamentally is not caring about people and is orientating them as units of production towards simply a narrow uh, vision of profitability. I, I mean, I also would have a slightly less uh, expansionist view than Raj of the role of business. And I would play up myself the, the, the genuine wealth, which I think non-market actors in societies also create. And I think there's a discourse around business around that, which uh, I'd probably be on a slightly different place, but that's probably another discussion. But I just thought I'd register that point. Thank you, Charles, for, for your answer. And let's go to Gary. Yeah, uh, I, I think I said more with uh, Charles's view on this, uh, in the sense that uh, there, there are fundamental changes in how we think of purpose. Uh, so in our paper, the general management paper that's going to come out next uh, in 22, uh, it, it's out online already. Uh, where we look at purpose in the for-profit firm and when we review the literature and we sort of see what's going on, there is a lot of uh, fragmentation in how we think about purpose and how we enact purpose and how we realize purpose, right? And, and, and so in, in from a fundamental sense, what, what, what has changed and what, what's likely where businesses rethink this is the, the focus on value creation for its stakeholders and how we create value and what uh, what types of value we create will come into um, a sharper focus uh, is uh, is my, my my belief right mm -hmm. uh, and that that uh, that's uh, Charles used much more elegant words in in defining this but uh, you know but how do you go about rethinking how I create value? how I appropriate value and how I distribute that value, right? These are three processes uh, that will change. So value creation, value appropriation, and value distribution. In value creation, we will shift towards more sustainable means. We will shift towards more um, where we would price in a lot more negative externalities, for example, uh, carbon tax is an example of pricing and negative externalities. The same thing we will start using with natural resources such as water, land use, and so forth, right? So how we create value, we will be rethinking some of that by uh, pricing in the cost of these negative externalities so that it's not just about the, the creation of profit. Because I disagree a little bit with uh, what Raj said earlier that profit is a social good. Uh, I don't think profit itself is a social good. The distribution of profit maybe, or how it is achieved it could be a social good, but not necessarily profit itself, right? So in some ways it's a tool rather than an outcome 
and we have to sort of say what is that how do we get to that tool in a in a in a sustainable way so uh, so charles put some elegant words around it and i think that's a that's a great way of thinking about it the other one is so one is to create value and we'll sort of be thinking about how do we create positive externalities right uh, uh, business as a generator of trust rather than a consumer of trust and i think that is one one way of thinking about it the second element of value appropriation is um, we think of greed and i think uh, uh, roy you framed it as when you went to mba school i think we all went to mba school around the same time maybe maybe you're a few years ahead of me but uh, uh, but when we think about that i think uh, that narrative has changed of how we appropriate profits has changed if you think of uh, uh, I, i've just written another paper on uh, digital sustainability and this idea that new ventures are creating completely new business models with new technologies that embody the sense of purpose this embody the sense of sustainability and then use that to create and capture value right and and so we are able to do things now that we could not do before because of technology. So think of uh, blockchain, for example, and the transparency that it affords, that, that you are then able to sort of say, uh, can I price in uh, a collective good, uh, which I could not have priced in earlier, right? Because I'm able to show that I'm contributing something that others are not able to contribute. So you can think about it. And if you're interested in that paper, I'm happy to send it across. But this idea of digital models that new ventures are creating models of capturing profit or creating and capturing profit in a completely different way than we are used to, right? That's one. And the other one is value distribution, right? Uh, and it, um, uh, Raj raised the right point that, you know, the value distribution comes because of the profits that businesses make that governments tax and then redistribute, right? But the firms have also been value distributing in quiet ways and social responsibility, they might call it, they might call it in how we care for our communities in which we operate and so forth. So I think even there, there is a compact that people will start to renegotiate on what is value distribution. So for the government of India, for example, put a tax on uh, like a CSR tax on the total revenue base that uh, profitability that uh, firms make so that it's able to redistribute. I'm not sure how successful it's gonna be, but uh, that restarts to rethink that, you know, instead of you trying to do corporate social responsibility, maybe there is a collective way of organizing it that, that is more efficient, but which also goes to similar ideas of, you know, philanthropy when, when uh, uh, the Gates Foundation and uh, Warren Buffett and everybody have joined together with the idea that, once you have scale, you can do things better in certain ways than if you try to do it yourself, right? And, and, and because the learning curve in each of these value distribution models is very steep. So rather than us trying to individually do it, is there a way to collectively do it? And that I think, even though we might not have quite the answer yet, I think there people are recognizing that collective efforts towards solving uh, what I call communal problems uh, uh, could be a way in which businesses uh, rethink some of their efforts. So I think there are fundamental shifts in value creation, um, appropriation and distribution. And uh, um, maybe I'm wrong, but I think uh, that's where the world is headed. Thank you, Gary. One of the purposes of this symposium was to have a conversation among you. And I, I see two uh, threads here. Roy, you like to implement my comments. There are also questions from, from the audience here, but First, this this tension about simultaneous or no trade-off, Rush, you have highlighted this this point as a framing of our mind. It's both, not either or. But at the same time, uh, for example, Charles mentioned that sometimes we need to make choices, and in, in that case, there is no uh, way of doing things simultaneously. So maybe you can have a, one word on this. Then Gary respond to Rush as well on this uh, issue of profit at social good, but just to have a, a little more conversation on this, will you please go a little more on, on this issue of trade-off or not trade-off, Rush and, and Charles? Yes, yeah, so uh, 
I do agree that trade-offs do exist sometimes uh, in the world, but the fact is that if you go looking for a trade-off, you're guaranteed to find it. There's no question. But if you reject, starting out, if you reject the idea of trade-offs, and you say, no, both of these goals are important and we want to figure out how to achieve them. And then if we are inspired by a higher purpose behind the whole thing as well, that's when you engage human creativity. And I think that to me, there's no nothing on this planet that has greater potential or with, is without limits as human creativity is. There's no limit to it. And it's extraordinary what people are able to do under constraints when we are told, you know, we cannot environmental damage and yet we have to achieve these, these outcomes and these numbers. People are able to rise to the occasion very much more often than not. And so I think challenging uh, each other and challenging ourselves to look for those, um, so like a cliche to say win-win, but really the synergistic outcomes, the, the rejection of trade-offs I think is fundamental. And then if you do find, despite all best efforts and engaging everybody's best creativity that we are forced to make a trade-off uh, in the short run, then make sure that it is in the short run and that we are determined not to face this trade-off again, right? Whether it's between paying our employees well and having low prices for our customers or high profits for investors, all of those have been shown to be false trade-offs. There's a wonderful book by Zen Epton called The Good Job Strategy, where she shows how paying people more and providing better benefits actually ultimately ends up reducing labor costs and you know, making things more efficient. I mean, you see that in Costco's business model versus a Walmart, right? There are many ways in which these things can happen. So I, I always strongly urge leaders to reject trade-offs in the beginning and then give it time and engage the creativity of your people, which is extraordinary. On the other question of whether profit is a social, I agree completely with Jerry that it matters how you make the money. I started by saying that, you know, if you, if you make money by imposing uh, costs and suffering on your customers and your employees and society, et cetera, I mean, that's not a business, that's a parasite, mm. right? You know, I mean, if you think about a business at one level, it's very simple. It's, if it's all about profit and profit equals revenue minus cost, then the name of the game is simply maximize revenue, minimize cost. How do we do that? Sell as much, charge as much as possible, whether people need it or not, uh, and then reduce cost. Pay people as little as possible, squeeze your suppliers, externalize burdens onto society or future generations, and you've made your profit. That profit to me is worth less than nothing. That is actually a net loss to society. And so that's a parasite. That's not a business. A true business is generating profit, so it matters how you make the money. But making money is, you know, those resources could have been invested elsewhere and generated a surplus return, which we then need to fund infrastructure and, you know, public education and all the other things that we have to do. So I think it's, I don't think we're in any kind of disagreement on that. I think maybe I didn't emphasize the right, right way uh, when I said that. Right. Charles, Gary, you would like to... So there's a, 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 a something I heard the other day from uh, an academic who works with businesses who uh, had had a, a bunch of leaders together and said, if all your products and services could talk, which one would you try to shut up? And I think it's a really good question because uh, certainly in the businesses that we've worked with, which are on the whole very large companies that are coming out of and wanting to escape the prison of a very narrow profit maximizing model. I say to them, look, almost certainly there are some things that you are doing that are profitable, that if you were really serious about this purpose-led approach, you would stop. And so I, I, I do think, and in my experience, it's always true. This. There are always some things and then you find them and you look at them. And then the really interesting question is how do you manage the transition? So mm -hmm. to take a one really big company that we're in a bit of dialogue with, which is BP. So BP have just over the last two years with a new chair and new chief executive have completely reset their purpose, which two years ago was to maximize profit and is now to reimagining energy for people and planet. They are on a 30 year transition. This is one massive set of mm. very, very difficult staged uh, compromises and workarounds and workouts. They've said that by 2030, they're going to get to 40 percent of changing from their oil and gas to renewable energy, and they're going to get the rest of the way by 2050. It's incredible what they're going to try and do. They're serious about it, but what the chairman said, and I was at a thing with him the other day, he said, for me, this is all about pace. It's all about how we keep the business profitable and manage the transition in such a way that we create a sustainable energy business by 2050. If we stop doing what we're doing now, we go out of business tomorrow. We can't do that, but we want to be serious about the transition and manage the transition effectively. Now, uh, to me, that is a whole series of trade-offs and really difficult trade-offs which are being made by a very large company that wants to be part of the future and not caught by the past. And it's great. 
because what they've done is they've set a very clear purpose that's exposed a gap between the present reality and where they want to be and they're working out now a series of strategies that enable them to make that transition and I, I think that that's what we should expect in a world where a lot of very large companies, if they're honest, are really challenging themselves about what they're doing, and they're facing some very painful questions if they're really honest about that. Right. So, the question uh, of uh, yes, just a sorry. quick addition to uh, I, I think uh, both Raj's and Charles's point are on the money in this one. Uh, uh, to, just to uh, add to that. When you think of businesses themselves, I don't think they wake up, uh, the CEOs wake up in the morning and say, how can I screw somebody today, right? So, so, so uh, the intent is the right intent in the sense where we sort of say, we need to address a collective problem. But these are significant choices that, that, that there are decisions that we have to make that are difficult. For example, for a bank, uh, are you okay to lend to um, uh, businesses that create industries that create negative externalities. So it's not easy for us to sort of say, oh, no, you shouldn't do that. So I, I was in Singapore till last month. I was the dean of the business school day. Uh, so let's take uh, palm oil as an example, right? Uh, uh, a Singapore bank could lend to an Indonesian uh, uh, palm oil uh, um, uh, farm, um, uh, forest, uh, and in that you you would you would ask the question, uh, is that okay to lend to palm oil because it it negatively affects SDG whatever the thing is on uh, uh, life on earth uh, right the forestry and diversity and so forth right biodiversity. Um, but the flip side is that there are three million uh, farmers who, who Indonesian farmers who are working in palm oil plantations. So uh, even within the SDGs, there is a trade-off that you would sort of say, if I pursue one, it uh, might negatively affect the other. So I believe very much in what uh, both Charles and Raj were talking about is the pace of change, is that it's not that these dualities do not exist, it's, it's the commitment that I make to, to right the wrong that might exist, right? And to do that over time, in a balanced way. And, and that, because we are in a pluralistic society with multiple stakeholders, uh, individual stakeholder groups would present their idea and their pressure to move it forward. But the organization has to reconcile the pace in which that it can do something uh, effectively, right? And I, and I think that realization and that discussion of, among multiple stakeholders to sort of say, as long as we're making the right commitment, uh, the right pace of change, then we are okay, right? Uh, uh, and, and that's where some disagreements happen, even within the US, for example, on uh, whether we're going fast enough on climate change issues, mitigation issues, whether we are, we, we are living taxes on the right kind of products or the right kind of inputs, right? Uh, so, so, so these are discussions that need to happen. They need to happen at a uh, possibly a more aggressive rate than they are doing now. But, uh, but fundamentally, I think businesses have, the pandemic has changed that view. And I think uh, I'm much more optimistic about organizations grappling with the pace of change and how we negotiate between these different stakeholder interests. And even among the sustainable development goals, that if I pursue one, does it hurt the other? Uh, is, is, is one that uh, companies uh, look at uh, very carefully. So. Um, but there is a lot, a lot of work that is going into this in terms of metrics, in terms of how, um, how companies uh, uh, measure, measure their footprint, uh, uh, me uh, measure the inputs, uh, looking through and the transparency of the supply chains, just amazing. We do not give enough um, uh, credit to the great effort being done by companies. And I think as academics, we should be able to showcase some of the great work that's being done mm. uh, and then say, and, and encourage them in a way that uh, allows them to change the pace and the conversations that they have, right? And I think that's, uh, so I'm much more heartened by, by what's going on. Um, uh, I, I wanna just talk, talk about just three things uh, in terms of when we have this discussion and, and, uh, uh, and uh, we, we, 
we thought a lot about when we were doing the review paper on how we frame uh, do this. We think of uh, sort of the framing of purpose, the the um, uh, when the the um, uh, when, when we talk about framing of purpose, we lo look at companies when they think about um, uh, sort of how do I craft the mission and values? What's the narrative that I use when I talk about purpose? Then from framing, you go to formalizing. How do I structure it? How, how do I embed it within my company? How do I govern it at the board of directors level or, or at different levels? Um, sorry that I'm weeping as we speak because my, my, my ophthalmologist advice was 30 minutes max a day of TV time, uh, so screen time. So I, I think I've exceeded that in just this, this session. Uh, then, then the third part is on realizing purpose. It's about what I talked about, value creation, appropriation, and the multi-stakeholder impact that we think about. So even when we think about purpose, there are three ways that specific processes we have to address. How do we frame it? How do we formalize it? And how do we realize it? And even in framing, companies are afraid of this. If I show myself as purpose-driven, somebody will come and pull out some negative thing about me and some other country and showcase me as, as bad and that'll create an overall negative greenwashing effect or a negative effect overall. So, so companies become hesitant in doing this. Uh, but I think there is a lot here uh, in, in how we frame, how we formalize and how we realize purpose. And I'm uh, much more with uh, what Charles and Raj were saying, that companies are really trying to think, figure out what's the pace and how do I negotiate between the multiple stakeholders that I have. Right, thank you, Gary. Seems that when we pull a, a question for conversation, it takes. So we need to continue this conversation after the symposium because this is where things really matter. So there are uh, two questions about purpose and, and two about business school. So uh, in the sake of time, I will move on to the third question, Roy, and then Elaine can wrap these other questions in the chat and, and, and do the closing remark. Oh, terrific. Well, this is uh, clearly my favorite question, and that uh, is to ask uh, each of you what would a post or what should a post pandemic business school look like? And uh, let's uh, let's change things up a little bit by um, reversing the order and, and starting with Jerry on this one. Uh, Roy, uh, you, you tricked me into thinking on my feet now. Um, but, but I have to I have to say this as a dean. Uh, I've been dean for the past seven years. Um, as a dean, I'm heartened by how business schools have embraced this. Right? We, we've we've had a few moments where business schools have um, have been showcased as being ineffective in in addressing this and tackling it uh, uh, head on. But I but I really. I really believe that uh, the business schools have embraced it. Um, what, what do I have a, as a sort of proof in the pudding in all of these things? Um, if you look at uh, our business school education, we have these standards bodies like AACSB and EFMD and so forth. For the first time, these standard bodies have then incorporated impact uh, as as the way that you would define a firm, uh, business school strategy, right? Uh, so, so the first principle, um, if you look at ACSB standards, the first standard is how is your business school creating impact and what are your strategies to achieve that? That conversation did not exist five, 10 years ago. We did not think of impact in, in the same way that we measure it, that we articulate it, and then we create a narrative or a strategy uh, a narrative around uh, sort of defining the business school's existence within sort of an impact lens, right? Uh, that's the first one. And I think that's a huge shift. Um, as a faculty member, as professors, we might not sort of uh, say, how does accreditation really matter on a day-to-day -day basis? But really what it does change is that way we look at business schools has shifted as well, right? And I, and I think that um, what we teach is also changing. Right, uh, and I think it's changing in uh, both subtle and in big ways. Right, uh, 
uh, if if we look at um, uh, how what uh, sort of uh, how we think of case studies and how we teach and so forth, now you can see a lot more case studies of local communities, interaction of uh, uh, firms within communities where business school faculty have been engaged in in in, in sort of realizing this. Uh, of course, uh, people like Raj and Charles are actively involved in shaping these dialogues, but but in the classroom itself, we our our material that we teach, our orientation of teaching is also changing, right? Uh, and I think that that is a big uh, big element. And the last piece I think is on research, where I I have some credibility, maybe not enough credibility, but uh, as an editor. When, when my biggest challenge when, when I was editor is to get the consensus that a grand challenge is a good thing for management scholars to, to push, right? Roy, you've been working on this for a long period of time, but you've never called it a grand challenge, right? Uh, uh, in some ways, we need to name it, whether to shame it or to encourage it. So, so actually naming it became an important thing. And so, once we've named it, now, as Hector said in the opening comments, uh, we've got prime, we've got um, uh, responsible business, we've got uh, uh, respons uh, res responsible research. You've got all of these different sort of actors and agencies now coming about and saying that, that what our thought leadership actually helps businesses transform themselves. So now you can see a lot of papers, a lot of research that is about businesses um, uh, that are focused on the common good or in some ways track, solving tractable problems or seemingly intractable problems, right? And, and that way I'm encouraged that business schools are doing this as well. So thanks. Thanks very much for that, Jerry. Actually, uh, quite quite inspiring. And I have to say that I, I have been very impressed about how universities as institutions generally have have uh, adapted with uh, a lot of effort uh, by good citizens in faculty to the to the pandemic. Uh, Charles, what what should the post pandemic business school look like? Well, look, I, I... Uh, unlike the rest of you, I, I come at this as an outsider, not an academic, uh, working with businesses. So let me make a provocation, though, uh, which uh, uh, from that position of uh, ignorance. Um, it seems to me that if there's a profound reset going on about the purpose of business itself in society, and that businesses should have a purpose to benefit society and should see themselves as fundamental human systems, human institutions orientated to human flourishing. If we buy that thesis, then the job of the business school is surely to produce leaders who will lead businesses to enable them to do that. And if you say, well, OK, so what is a what is a leader of a business that's got that orientation and mindset uh, have that a previous kind of business leader doesn't have? And my answer to that is competence and character. In other words, it seems to me that all the things that business schools would teach you if you wanted to learn how to run a profit maximizing business, you probably still need to know. But you also need to know a bunch of other things and to be developing the reflexes in yourself about how you think about people, empathy, the quality of relationships, the quality of judgment that you make, courage, soft skills, in other words. And as the workplace is changing so fast and over the lifetimes of most MBA students will change dramatically again, it seems to me that the inculcation of, if you like, the soft skills of character formation are super important. Um, so what kind of human beings come out of the business school process? How are people formed by their experience of studying, not just intellectually, academically with graphs and Excel spreadsheets and all of that, but as people and how they relate to other people and their capacity to draw out the best in other people and to create teams that are truly human centered and functioning. A non-trivial thing, I know, but I would say that for me, if business schools become places, conservatoires of virtuosos who are leaders in a human sense, and we need that more than ever, we need brilliant leaders in business who not only have the attributes that we previously thought important, but we have these other things as well, uh, which are softer, but in many ways, much the most fundamental thing that the world needs now. 
the, I, I love your provocation and I see some of the audience members do it all. Just a, a quick follow-up. Would that mean uh, if we're uh, adopting a more humanistic view of, of education and business that we might want to incorporate more humanities in management? Yes. Yeah. I met Bing Ziyang, who runs the uh, Kong Chi School of Business. He said, everybody has to study Confucian history and philosophy. And I said, why? And he said, because they're all rich and I want them to be enriched. <laughs> That's great. Raj, what, what should a, a business, a post-pandemic business school look like? Well, first of all, I really want to appreciate what Jerry and Charles have said, and I agree with everything. And I just would like to build on that a little bit. You know, to me, it's not only who we produce, but who comes in and who we attract, you know? Uh, I did a study some years ago looking at the mindsets of entering business uh, students versus their friends. In other words, do you feel like you're, you've uh, sacrificed your idealism, you're just being pragmatic, you're gonna get a job, you're getting an accounting major, whatever it is. And I found a significant uh, evidence that that is indeed the case. That people who come into business school, especially at the undergrad level, you know, they're sort of playing it safe. They're maybe a little more mercenary minded. They're not pursuing their dreams and their passions and, and so forth. I think we need to attract the most idealistic do-gooding people in the world into business schools. And that's not happening. You know, I used to do this summer program with these uh, kids who were from all over the country on leadership, sustainability and ethics, like 45 of them. And I asked them, how many of you intend to go into business and not one raised their hand? Why? They all want to start nonprofits. Why? Because they want to be on the side of, you know, uh, ethics and, and doing good in the world. I said, you can do more through business than you can through a nonprofit. Solve the same problem, try to do it through a business. So, but again, we're not reaching that because the image, the concept of business out there is around this mercenary, right? It's all about uh, greed and we celebrate that and so forth. So I think that needs to change. And, and I'm not quite sure how to do that, but we need to present an inspiring, uplifting, noble story of business and and part of it is just educating people about what capitalism has done for humanity which i think most of us don't even recognize so i think that that's one to me the foundations of business schools largely are still rooted in finance and the, the whole theories around uh, you know shareholder value maximization and agency theory all of those things i think we need to end the sort of domination of finance accounting i think in terms of what defines a business education we need to focus on the whole person uh, left brain and right brain. You know, we're heavily analytical and uh, quantitative and so forth, which is fine. But you know, all of the other ritual things that happen. Also, we need to integrate masculine and feminine. You know, we have a very, very masculine culture in the world of business generally. I would have to say, and I think we need to bring in more of those qualities of empathy, compassion, inclusiveness, etc., which are so-called feminine uh, uh, qualities. Uh, and we need to educate and create the whole person in that sense. And, and a much greater focus on leadership and self-awareness. I think we have a lot of courses on management, but very, very little on leadership. And ultimately that's, I think, what we need. And that's rooted in, in cultivating their consciousness, in becoming, be, becoming more aware, more awake about what is the role of business and society? What is your role? Why are you here? What are we trying to do? What's your individual uh, purpose? So ethics, purpose, consciousness, leadership, all of these things I think need to be central. And uh, I think Charles in the chat asked about some kind of an oath, a Hippocratic oath kind of thing. And actually at the end of our book, The Healing Organization, we have a, a pledge or an oath, I think we call it, which I'd like to share if it's okay in one minute. Um, we call it you know, the healing oath. And it has three phrases. And the first is uh, in Latin, primum non nocere, or first do no harm. I will operate my business in a way that causes no harm to others or to mother earth. Second, malice eradicare, root out evil. I will never enable or collude with abuse or exploitation. I will stand for fairness, truth, beauty, integrity, and basic goodness. And amor vincit omnia, love conquers all. I will operate from love and always measure success by the fulfillment, abundance, and joy I generate for all those whose lives I touched. And so something like this, I think that if we have business students come out with, uh, would be powerful because these are important commitments that we can make and then we lead according to those. So, you know, our, our management needs to become a profession, have its own code of ethics, etc. all of those things, and people need to come out. You know, to me, idealists are the ones who change the world for the better, and most of them don't go to business school. And I think that that can change, and uh, that I, hope, I hope that is part of the change. And not to discount all of the wonderful things many business schools around the world are doing, and I know they are doing them, 
but very often those are at the fringes and they're not in the core curriculum. And I find when I teach conscious capitalism, the people who take my class are not the ones who would benefit the most from that class because they're already kind of thinking like this, right? But the ones who are so-called hardcore on the path towards uh, uh, investment banking or consulting, et cetera, they're purely focused on, on, on that side. I think that we need, to, we need to actually change the core curriculum. That's to me the most uh, important need. Uh, fantastic. And one of the common threads I'm hearing is that we, we made to re-examine re our assumptions about the role of science in knowledge as well, which is uh, uh, very, very, very provocative, but, but probably uh, very timely. Um, speaking uh, Roy, Roy, uh, just uh, if, you, if you allow me, um, uh, I, 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 so sort of what Raj told right now resonates a lot with what, what I'm thinking about as well, right? So, um, Raj highlighted these three elements and he talked about the whole person, but uh, I joined Georgetown recently, well, this month, that, that the whole theme is cura personalis, which is the whole person, right? And, and then uh, if you're thinking about it that way, uh, the Jesuit education, uh, uh, Georgetown is a Jesuit school, has had these elements right through, right? Uh, that it has not been just a new thing that, that has come now. But what our discussion highlights is that that point has become more relevant now than before, right? That, so it's not that our system does not have it. It's just that, that our emphasis on that system has been less so and the events of the past have just shown a lot more on, on these values for us to rethink uh, that, right? So for us as educators, uh, the impetus is, uh, is now about how do we use the momentum to, to rethink uh, some of the precepts of um, uh, business education, uh, uh, like Charles talked about in competence of character, or like Raj talked about is, you know, we talk about business education, but access is probably one of the biggest issues in business education, right? Uh, so how can we figure out models where, where we, we create access to individuals who are truly gonna be change makers in the world that allow them to do it, right? It's not that the change makers of the world don't want to go to business school. It's just that they cannot afford to go to business school, right? Uh, or in some ways broadly, so afford to get a high class, a high, high sort of cost university education nowadays. So, so rethinking some of that, would make a huge impact on how we sort of mainstream or bring bring into the business school fold uh, individuals who are change makers, who have the value systems that Raj talked about, and also helping us recalibrate some of these issues of competence and character that Charles was talking about. So, oh, that's that's a brilliant, Jerry, and you know, it just makes me wish we we had more time to talk then about how that would change the mode of delivery of business education as well. But we, we unfortunately don't have that time. Um, Hector, am I right in thinking that I'm turning this over to Elaine now for some summary comments? Yes, we are, we are on, on time. So for Q and A, if Elaine would like to take some of the, the questions, I can help you. I was uh, seeing the chat and they see about the, the change of attitude then the talents and um, there's a change of mind of administrators as well because they prepare a student for having a career but all we are talking about purpose maybe the student then they cannot get a job so there's a, a debate there between Maho Murcia and, and Gordon about this and it was the last discussion you have in the panel but Elaine I leave this to, to you. Okay, well, I was just going to kind of thread through the uh, chat to see if there are questions that people have volunteered. And if you have questions, you can type those in the chat. Uh, Elaine, we... can I put you on the spot? Because you uh, started that article, you led that article for managing with purpose. So, you know, think on your feet and said, what, what, what do you think about it? Rather than just helping coordinate the questions, what do you think about it? <laughs> well, you know, I... I um... I think we're on to something very, very important. Um, and it's important. I'm an organizational behavior person. I'm concerned about motivating people in organizations. And I don't think people are motivated when they find their work meaningless or they find their organizations corrupt. 
And so I really do think creating organizations with purpose has, has multiple effects all the way down to individual or, or you know, employees and how they feel about their work in the organization. So, you know, I'm excited about this. Um, I think um, I've seen, I was part of the uh, AMJ crew when we tackled um, grand challenges. I'm still doing a lot of reviewing for AMJ and other journals, and I've seen a huge number of articles coming through that are really doing the kinds of things I think we hoped that issue would generate in terms of research. And so again, my primary role is research, um, and I, I see see that happening a lot more than when I was, you know, working with Jerry on the uh, on the journal and on this uh, editorial. So I'm I'm heartened also, you know, and I think. Uh, some of the suggestions that came out in the talk today are really good ones. I've, I've tried to identify some themes and I can certainly go through those. I wanted to make sure if somebody had a question in the chat, they had an opportunity to ask the panel because they've been patiently waiting. And, and then I can just go through and summarize a couple of the things that I pulled out. Does that sound good? Uh, thanks, Elaine. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, didn't mean to put you on the spot, but no, yeah. that's all right. Hey, you know, <laughs> I, I'm I'm a qualitative researcher, so my my automatic mode is to take note and listen. <laughs> so, all right, so let's see here. Um, I think we've got a, a question from Sarab. Am I seeing right? Are you there, Sarab? Um, so he's resonating with, or she's resonating with all the comments being made. Um, but the main question here is what suggestions do you have for getting faculty and administrators to re-examine their perspective? And so I can certainly empathize with the context in which this question is phrased. You know, we may have good intentions as researchers and as faculty who are engaged in studying organizations with purpose, but how do you get faculty and administrators to re-examine their perspective? Any thoughts on that one? So uh, let me start, uh, you know, as a dean, I think, um, uh, th this is one of those issues that uh, people have raised all the time. Um, I think a lot is going on where leadership of universities and business schools uh, have been trying to incentivize faculty uh, to do what, what is the right thing, right? Uh, and incentivize, when I talk about incentives, it's not just uh, not about money. It is about the giving the the freedom and space to experiment and build out uh, new programs, new uh, new research ideas, and supporting them in a way that uh, shows that the business school actually has impact beyond. So, one of the things that I've done in my institution uh, earlier uh, at SMU is uh, when we go for tenure, we talk about research, teaching, and service. Um, I added the fourth dimension of impact. Right? That, that now allows every faculty member who's going to go up for tenure or promotion to talk about his or her own work in a way that says, how am I creating impact in a community which is beyond the academic community? Right? Uh, you would say that might not be as important, but really what it has changed is that it's changed the, um, it's shifted that, that dialogue of individuals saying, you know, even if I do some great things, where somebody's adopted my practice and so forth. I have no way of it being reflected in my accomplishments except through research papers or something like that. This gives a parallel way of talking about the work that I do or, and the meaning that I, um, that, that I take away from my work, right? So uh, that is a big, big step uh, if we can do that. And I think uh, some universities are starting to do that. Uh, perhaps I was a bit earlier than others, simply because of my own research bent that, uh, uh, as a dean, but, but my faculty did not object to it. In fact, they took to it uh, like fish to water. They said, uh, you, you know, if uh, this is something that we really want to show, and it might be difficult in the initial phases because our research and tenure processes are quite narrow, uh, but over time, let's say five years, 10 years, that will shift, right? Uh, that gives a new way of expression that they didn't have before. The other element that, that, uh, um, that there are communities now that are supporting this, right? Uh, uh, Ansui and uh, um, uh, Jerry Davis and others who created this uh, responsible research forum, right? And, and 
uh, and that community uh, has flourished uh, where where it's become a, a, a mechanism for people to talk to others who have similar interests in research, find co-authors, find, uh, find data, find companies willing to work with them. So I think that's another way that even the community itself has stepped forward, a research and faculty communities stepping forward across disciplines uh, to tackle this in a, in a, in a, in a systematic way. So, so my my while my uh, my answer might be uh, might sound defensive, actually it is not. I, I think we are uh, we are in the beginning phases of doing that, but we are doing a lot, and the effects of this will show over time, right? Um, uh, because our tenure processes have been there for whatever periods of time that there are for us to change that, and for us to change the narrative, train students, and embrace that narrative will take a couple of decades of doing that. But I think we are well on our way in that. Good. Well, I think there, there are a lot of suggestions being made in the comments section, in the chat section, and also some resources that people are sharing. So I would encourage those participants to look through the chat. There weren't really ended up not being very many questions. Um, there is a question about whether the business school student should focus on societal or, or career impact at the early stage of their career. So is this something that we get people doing from the get-go? Is it something that we can expect of more senior students or is this something that we do from the beginning? And I would probably guess that we, we'd want them to be launched right from the beginning if it's gonna be part of our essence and who we are. But if anybody disagrees, well, let me just go through um, through just a couple of themes that I pulled out from the questions. I think, uh, Elaine, I think Raj wanted to say something. Uh, oh, I'm so sorry. Go ahead, Raj. I didn't see. Uh, no, I was just going to say that that's the false trade off to me. There's no reason why you cannot have an exciting and fast growing career while you're simultaneously having a positive impact. In fact, that is the pathway, I think, in the future. And that I think that future is here today. Yep. You know, that's not something that's, and it's not a, a small subset. I think that's going to be the mainstream. Our story here. It's changing very, very rapidly. We are at a tipping point. Okay, great. Uh, uh, Ilan, um, can I add something on this? Uh, sure, sure. Um, one of the things we've uh, students struggle with in a very practical way is jobs, right? Uh, when they come to business school, they when uh, not the undergraduate, but in the postgraduate world, uh, they, there is a focus on I'm here for a year, I'm here for a year and a half or two years. And by the time I get out, I have to recover the value for money in my business education. And the best way to do that typically tends to be in um, uh, professions uh, that, that pay well, right? Uh, um, so, so there is, in fact, some, some tension in the sense that um, uh, if I take up jobs that, that uh, are upfront lower pay, uh, in my lifetime of earnings, is there is there uh, uh, um, uh, is there a sacrifice that I'm making, right? That but that tension does exist. For example, I see that in startups, right? Uh, students come into an MBA school thinking, "Wow, I want to be an entrepreneur," but then they realize it doesn't pay as much as going joining Goldman Sachs. So, uh, so then they sort of have to make that call of whether uh, Goldman Sachs. I'm picking Goldman Sachs, but it could be anybody, right? Uh, um, uh, they have to make that call of whether that uh, that enrichment that comes from venturing is is different from uh, the financial incentive to do so, right? Uh, uh, but but uh, that trade off still happens in, in very practical ways. Uh, but I, I'm encouraged by Raj's comment that businesses themselves will change, right? So so in the interim, uh, this goes to this question of pacing that Charles talked about. Is that um, we want to train people with the value set of being positive change makers in the world. Right? The profession they choose might be different initially, but we are hoping that if we've made a positive impact and an imprint, that it should show over time. Right? And that's that's where I, I, I as a dean, I sort of sort of see this and say, you, you know, I can't make this. I can't advise my students in good conscience to say you should sacrifice a Goldman Sachs job and go join the social enterprise because the pay difference is so vast that in, in your lifetime earnings that you will be a lot worse off financially 
even though you may be better off uh, in, in moral enrichment, right? Uh, or in meaning in work that you do. Um, but that's an individual call. So as a system, then what I say is, maybe we should be focusing our efforts on the values that we impart and the skills that we impart and how people choose their lives would eventually and run their lives eventually will show up over time. Yeah, I think that, I don't know, I think it might have been um, Jay that mentioned in one of his comments that focus on the mindset versus the skill set. And that's pretty much what you're saying, I think, Jerry. And that's a huge thing. I mean, if you can get people to change their worldview, um, the skills will come. It's not, you know, this mandatory. Well, I think, I think we've reached the time, Hector. <laughs> I've not been a very good steward of time. Yeah, Elaine, uh, I'd like to hear your then... thoughts on the summary thoughts, please. <laughs> well, uh, well, we have an additional summary. minutes, but <laughs> we're at time. I just, I just took some notes of things that I saw repeatedly come up in the conversation in terms of values. One of them was functional interdependence of everybody. You know, if we um, focus on that in a post-pandemic world, I think we're much better suited, and that includes the even the government. Uh, we check our assumptions and make sure that we uh, consider how we're framing organizations, but also um, how we feel about things. Um, in terms of the purpose of business, I think this trade-off discussion was amazingly interesting. Um, I have a dean who studies paradox, and she's a both-and kind of person, <laughs> and so I was thinking of her during this discussion. But we, I love the expression, we need to move from grab and go to give and grow. Uh, that was something that I captured. Uh, there was a bit of a discussion on the pace of change and how it's important, uh, you know, that we um, be more optimistic, I think, in some ways about that. Um, I liked what I think it was Jerry said that we need to focus on some processes like how we frame things, how we formalize purpose, and how we actually realize purpose. Um, and in terms of business schools in a post-pandemic world, I do agree a lot with the discussion about the standards are changing. This focus on impact has been really huge in terms of how it's affected what we do in business schools. And also, I've already talked about research. Um, I love the expression creating virtuosos in the human sense. I think that was something Charles had suggested. Uh, and then finally, um, Raj's healing oath, first do no harm, root out evil, love conquers all. I think that's probably a great note to end on. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Well done. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming.